avant garbage. I had to beat an old lady with a stick to get these cranberries. <laughs> Welcome, ladies, and gentlemen, those who lie betwixt or beyond, to yet another episode yeah, of, you don't know what, you know. How could you be, I guess, what is beyond? Uh, beyond, like me, I'm beyond a mortal man. Well, like. An ascended god king. I guess non-binary is in between, right? Or outside. Or, I guess it's depends outside. On, so depends that's... on what you'd ask, who you ask. Okay. Yeah. So it could be considered either. Yeah. Okay. Welcome to another episode of Off on Garbage. The official podcast of Martin Coolhaven. Yeah, so in between um, recording and releasing our Brimstone episode, and now um, Martin Coolhaven has uh, retweeted uh, some of my shit, so mm -hmm. we are now endorsed by the film director of Brimstone. Yeah, so come back next week for the Martin Coolhaven episode where we will have him on as a guest officially confirmed, for real. Oh, yeah. If we get a following, we should try to interview him. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I, what we learned is he checks his, he searches his movies' names and his name on Twitter. Yeah. So, we can just tweet at him for an interview. Thanks, Mister Coolhaven. Mm -hmm. That we would be funny movies. if we did it now, just to like twenty viewers, just mm -hmm. be like, hey, uh, director, would you like to do an interview on our podcast? Mm -hmm. There's actually a chance it works, but yeah, if he researches our podcast, there's no chance it works, but. Mm -hmm. It actually is cool, though, because he did say on... Because I couldn't find anywhere anything about his new movie other than that he's been researching for it. And he did tweet at me and tell me that they're going to be filming it um, at so the So now end of this we're year. breaking news journalism podcast. Yeah, on the Dutch film industry. Mm -hmm. But um, as much as we're making jokes about... I've being been the, undercover for 20 years in the Dutch film industry. As much as we make jokes about, like, you know, being the official podcast of Cool Haven, he... I mean, I've only seen that one movie, but it's very good, and I am very excited by whatever he makes going forward, and I mean... Look at that. This is how uh, people sell out. He gets one tweet from a director, and now he's their biggest fan. What? We're, so, all, we're already sucking Guys, it. also, this podcast is sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. It's my favorite mobile game. Uh, no, I would say we were already sucking his dick last week about. Yeah, I've movie. seen one of his movies. He could be a horrible director. I no, don't no, know. I was just gonna say based on Brimstone, I'm excited for whatever he does next. Like Shutter Island is a good movie, but Martin Scorsese is a horrible director. Apparently, it's supposed to be noir. So mm. excited to see whatever. That yeah, is. yeah. I think you were talking about this last time. Yeah, it's like some noir detective film thing. Probably be good. Mm-hmm. So, what are we talking about this week? Um, we are talking about uh, a story based on you, your life story, the mm -hmm. Pukipski tapes, uh, which is a a underground, uh, deep web, web three mm -hmm. uh, indie movie of very little renown, mm -hmm. which I actually thought was more popular than it is. Uh, I guess because I live in some sort of bubble where in which a a move, found footage horror movie about a about a serial killer and rapist is uh, is more normal than it is to the average person for me. Yeah, because, like, um, to our, the one listener I know, uh, hi, James, I was going to say it's fairly well known, but, yeah, like... We should just start saying random names and we'll get somebody. Well, no, but the thing is, because we know... You know I know you're listening, Clarence. I was going to say, we know my friend James will be listening, so yeah, we can yeah. always just address him directly. No, but I just mean in general, right? Mm -hmm. If there's a, Once we get a larger base of viewers, just occasionally address somebody by name and give mm -hmm. them paranoia. Yeah, there you go. The um, Have you seen that clip of uh, there's a, a fan ringside and Roman Reigns looks at him and goes, I can see you're high. Uh, and just like the dude fucking looks like he's losing his shit. Yeah, that's pretty funny. But the Poughkeepsie Tapes is, yeah, it's less, because, like, one of my favorite podcasts in the world, and one of your favorite podcasts in the world, uh, Chillery, is I know is Last Podcast on the Left. Mm -hmm. And, like, the host will talk about the Poughkeepsie Tapes, okay? like, uh, I think Henry Zabrowski mentioned it, and he said it as if it's, like, the most well-known movie in the world, um, even though uh, very much, but yeah, I think that's just kind of speaking to that bubble you're talking about yeah. of... Yeah, I thought it was more well known than it was because mm -hmm. it's a cult classic. Um, but the guy, <laughs> Are, should we tell us when this movie should be a cult classic too? Mm -hmm. Well, this one a actually sequel. is. 
Yeah, I guess it's a pretty small cult, though. Smaller yeah. than you'd expect. And uh, Adam Wingard, the director of this movie, went on to direct Netflix's ne- Death Note. So, really? Did he? Yeah, he really did. And Godzilla vs. Kong. That's just confusing three movies. Because there's two of them are good, but for completely different well, reasons. Well, it's like one of them is like an experimental, sort of artistic, found footage, horror movie. mockumentary horror movie. One of them is just a bad movie. Mm-hmm. And then one of them is like good, but in a, like a soulless corporate way. Mm-hmm. So it's very confusing. Yeah. Shout out Adam Wingard for being one of the more confusing film directors. Are those the only three movies he's made? Uh, no, there's some more sprinkled in there that are kind of in between. Because okay. he started as a... Have you ever heard of the term mumblecore des- describing like uh, indie M- movies? Mumble mumble rap? Oh, well, yeah. Um, no, mumblecore is the idea of like... You know the kind of horror movies like Hereditary or something where it's a bunch of people... Oh, bad kind of, movies. ...kind of talking quietly and they're like, uh, I have depression and there's a thing trying to kill me. He started as like... Bad a, movies. Apparently, because I did some research, he started as like making those kind of movies... Then made that, mm-hmm. and then somehow got picked up by to make Death Note. Okay. And then for some reason, people saw Death Note and decided to hire him to make Godzilla vs. Kong. Well, you know what's interesting is Netflix's Death Note is a better movie than Hereditary, so he he does have that going for him. I'm still I'm does it be forever mad at Netflix's Death Note just because Willem Dafoe as Ryuk is perfect. Mm-hmm. It just is. Yeah. So, the Poughkeepsie tapes, I have a kind of bias against found footage horror movies, because I think most, because this one's good. Um, Cloverfield's think, mid. Cloverfield's mid. I've not seen The Blair Witch. I think a lot of them are just kind of shovelware movies, where they're using the, um, they're using the low budget, like, thing as an excuse to just not make it very interesting, because you can make a found footage horror movie fairly cheaply. Well, it's a good idea for a uh, like a filmmaker mm-hmm. who's like an amateur filmmaker. amateur film or student filmmaker. Like the original Blair Witch Project, I think it's boring. It's a student it, film, right? Yeah, but it's a. I mean, I think it's boring, but it's a really cool idea for a student film. Yeah, I mean, the, the idea that a student film is a boring but okay like actual horror movie is pretty impressive. Yeah, because they made that on like no money. Yeah, but I mean, the main thing that sets the Poughkeepsie tapes apart from most found footage horror movies is the mockumentary aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Because the entire thing, for those who haven't seen the Poughkeepsie tapes yet, um, it is entire. It's framed about as a documentary about a fictional serial killer who recorded all of his crimes and left the tapes behind so that the uh, the police would find them. So the documentary uses found footage tapes, but the idea is is that these are tapes that were really found that are being used in a documentary. It's not just playing the uh, tapes of the serial killer. And we're being provided by, like, quote-unquote expert analysis by people on how what this says about the serial killer. Yeah, it's like a mix of talking head interviews and expert testimony, like a regular documentary would do, mm-hmm. cut in between with, uh, with you know, longer uh, plays from the tapes talking about the different killings. And because of that, I think that... It actually does. It really benefits because I think it um, it is like the it takes the best aspects from the most interesting documentaries I've ever seen, and like um, better aspects from found footage horror movies about like what makes a found footage thing scary. Yeah. Um, because a lot of because it's a videotape we're getting, we we kind of like it's already in the past. So there's no tension where it's like when there's a our protagonist in a horror movie is being stalked by a monster. Mm-hmm. They don't have that kind of tension because this is stuff that already happened in the past. But what it has is it has lingering horror throughout it from yeah. um, the tapes, and it knows how to like play that to its advantage. Also, it creates tension by the fact that you know the outcome, but when it happens more slowly, you're always waiting for when you know. Um, like there are certain scenes. Uh, for example, when his first killing with the little girl, or the, when he kills the couple in a car, mm. there are certain scenes where uh, the killer 
spends like a long extended period of time pretending to be normal around the people he's about to kill Mm -hmm. and it creates this and then there's also later in the movie one of the best scenes in the movie Mm -hmm. is two girl scouts come into his house Mm -hmm. to buy cookies and you think he's going to kill them but then uh like uh i guess this is relying on plot details we need to give the synopsis but mm-hmm. but the the sex slave he has captured in his basement uh mm-hmm. starts making noises and so he has to let the girls go but all of those scenes sort of use the technique that uh of uh you know the outcome and then once it's subverted but mm-hmm. you think you know the inevitable outcome of his action but you're waiting for the other shoe to drop which creates a lot of tension mm-hmm. even if you uh even if you know the outcome so if we want to give a brief synopsis um, it's kind of weird too, since it is the documentary style. Yeah. But essentially, it follows the development of the career of you call it a career, I guess. Yeah. The serial killer. And the which, they call him the Water Street Butcher. That's the... the the name when he's a, a prostitute killer. Hmm. But I think in general, he's just the Poughkeepsie killer. Yeah. And then later, I think we learn his name. Uh, well, he, and apparently in the like the fake documentary credits, he's mm. called Edward Carver. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's probably a fake name based on the fact that uh that um, he wanted his apartment or whatever to be found. And an, an important detail is that it seems that by the time of the making of the docu- documentary, they more or less know who he... They don't yeah. I mean, They don't know his name, like his social security number, but they have a pretty good idea of his voice, what he looks like, like that They don't know what thing. he looks like. Don't they have a, a, like a vague idea? They have like a really vague police sketch from... Well, uh, they have a police sketch, they have like a great like grainy footage of him... But he's wearing a mask, or his face is hidden in the grainy footage. Well, there's the one where he's uh, at the gas station. But he looking. knows he's being recorded in that, so he's, like, signing to the camera to leave clues. Mm-hmm. So we, I don't think they well, have... But you, see, you can kind of see his face. No, but the the point is, I mean, is that you can't see his face, because he's specifically hiding it. In the video, you can't see his face. Nah, yeah. So I, I don't think that's, like, a correct reading, I think, because the, even one of the guys says is he's probably killing somewhere else mm-hmm. right now. Well, but my point is is that they, they know a lot about him because of this. Well, but, like, the idea that they're, like, on his trail, mm-hmm. they're not on his trail. They have no idea. Yeah, not like. anymore. Yeah. Because it seems like at one point they were closer, but... Uh, well, but the issue, they, it doesn't seem like they were very close because the way they caught him, you know... Is I that guess he gave up should, the case. We should summarize the plot. Okay, so he begins killing, he kills a little girl, um, he kills a couple, and so you're talking about those two first killings, um, there's a lot of, like, tension in them because he's pretending to be normal throughout Yeah, it. Yeah, like, he does, he's a hitch, he hitchhikes with a couple. The other one, he just runs up to a little girl in her front yard, starts talking to her, and then eventually, like, hits her in the head with a hammer and takes her into his car and kidnaps her. Mm. And eventually kills her, and then the other one he hitchhikes and mm. pretends to be uh, pretends to need a ride somewhere until he strikes and kills them while they're driving. Mm-hmm. So in both of these, you have that aspect of him uh, pretending that he uh, he is just a normal guy with some regular request, and then the other shoe drops, and they use that tension technique. Very much the bomb under the table idea of yeah, because like the, in with the documentary like title slides, they're like first blood. So we know he's going to kill someone. We're just, like, waiting on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and something I like about whoever portrayed the serial killer here does a really good job because of the fact that he's very, like... Uh, you and I have both listened to... I mean, it's basically a last pod. Um, but, like, true crime stuff about serial killers. And, like, I think something that's very true about almost all serial killers is they're all, like, fucking awkward weirdos. Yeah. So the... Not well adjusted. Yeah, well, yeah, but like, like the lack of confidence that when he first starts killing yeah. is like I feel like very reminiscent of like real serial killers who are just so fucking weird. And then the the killing, the power they get out of it is what like they feel completes them. Well, yeah, you notice there's like there's like two tones of voice mm-hmm. that he has, and it's when he's trying to pretend to be a normal guy, he sounds like really awkward and mm-hmm. unsure. Yeah. And then when he sort of gets angry and starts to go into, like, killer mode, he has, like, a very commanding, sure-of-himself voice. Yeah, like, his his normal voice is, like, almost, like, adult, like, Morty from Rick and Morty, where he's like, um, uh, uh, like, it's very... Well, it's not that. No, it's not quite that bad, but it's very... He feels very unsure of himself and kind of awkward. Yeah. And stumbly. Um, 
it very much uh, I don't know I, I just feel like that's really good at acting yeah and clearly Adam Wingard uh, as strange a director as he is with his uh, filmography clearly I have to assume he and like the people who wrote that either they did it accidentally and it's impressive but they must have like researched real serial killers to an extent of like to try to get that character of you're talking about of the the, the two sides of him. Mm -hmm. And I think the way they characterize him throughout that is really good. Yeah, I, I think it's a pretty interesting portrayal of like a... Uh, a uh, Like the mental state. I mean, I don't think they get too far into the mm -hmm. actual... Uh, actual thought process of the killer or anything. But I think what's there is a, it's at least interesting. I mean, there's the idea he uses a lot of theatrics. Like, mm -hmm. he wears a mask, like a plague doctor mask and shit. Mm -hmm. So they play in a lot to the idea of, like, how people, a lot of, like, killers like that will uh, create some sort of alternate persona that they blame for the killing, which alleviates any potential oh, guilt. Oh, Sam! Sam made yeah, him do it! like the son of Sam. Um, but, uh... But anyways, continue with the plot synopsis. The, the main point of the movie revolves around the fact that he kidnaps... Uh, he keeps a woman. She kills her uh, her boyfriend. Oh, one second. With the couple killing, can I just add a detail there? Sure. It's important. Uh, they point out that he, he, the, he had like the route planned out that they would take. Um, and it's only the second kill we, we've seen. But it implies like a level of organization and... Um, like thinking out that's like incredibly elaborate mm -hmm. to where like he he was planning on routing them to a abandoned gas station so that even if they made it to their destination he would still like have nobody around to kill him and he also like you said he signs to the security camera in a gas station yeah he signs a uh, red house which is where he hid one of the bodies mm -hmm. and he signs this before even meeting mm -hmm. his victim so he had planned out where he was going to dispose of his bodies and stuff. He fucking Babe Ruth called that shot right there. Mm hmm And he also, um, that's also where, uh, they talk about, um, he, like, his usage of the camera. Because when he kills the couple, he claims that, um, he's making a documentary about his trip. Which is kind of... Well, he's making shooting, a, like, a whole movie. A whole movie trip. about his trip. But they point out when he strangles the woman in there, he turns the camera around to face her. So he's strangling her with one arm from behind her. Well, he's got a rag with some yeah. chemical on it. Yeah, so, so he's, he's uh, trying, he's putting her out with like um, chloroform or something. Mm -hmm. But then turns the camera around um, so he's holding it in front of her. So you can see her. her face as he, uh, as he takes knocks her, her out. Or whatever, yeah. And they talk about like the sadism and the idea of like he is a filmmaker killer. Like, he is, like, if um, if Martin Scorsese snaps one day. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, all those years and years of videotapes, that's a movie that's too long right there. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, but, yeah. Sorry, back to the sex slave. Continuing with the plot synopsis, uh, the main portion of this movie, and really most of the scariest parts, revolve around the fact that he... Uh, he kills. He sneaks into a woman's house, kills her boyfriend. He st he stalks her a lot before this, mm -hmm. and then he. She says she felt like she was being watched for a few days. Yeah. Was it? Is it like? It's Susan? not a few days. Uh, it was like a long period. Of time. Yeah. Is her name Susan? I don't know. I don't remember. Carol, maybe. Who Carol. Knows? Carol. That's her name. Um. But uh. But he kills her boyfriend and kidnaps her, mm -hmm. and, you know, just basically he ends up keeping her for, like, eight years mm -hmm. and torturing her, and eventually she becomes, like, a Stockholm Syndrome accomplice. She ends up, he gets her to kill some of his future victims. Well, even more so than a man or than a um, accomplice, she becomes, like, a, a fucking, like, mannequin, like a puppet. To where she she literally can't function without being given instructions of what to do yeah. because she's been so psychologically damaged that she's just like an instrument of his will rather than her own person. Yeah, well, it goes on to become the scariest part or the most unsettling part. I guess it's not like actively. It's terrifying. lingering horror. Lingering so horror. Yeah, uh, is um, is uh, eventually he lets himself like he leaves. But oh, I guess we should cover that he frames the cop. To just yeah. cover the synopsis. So at one point, is the idea is that um, he one of the things that makes him so unique as a serial killer is his ability to switch up his mo uh, back and forth. Where most serial killers are like you know 
uh, Gary Ridgeway, you know, he killed prostitutes or dumped them in a river. Um, they don't really switch. And so that's one of the reasons why it's, he's hard to catch, because um, he doesn't have one MO. But at one point, once they start to get onto him, he completely switches MOs and starts exclusively killing prostitutes and dumping them in the river, a la Gary Ridgeway. Um, and I don't think he dumps them in a river. Some of them are in the river. So some of them are in the field, just generally in the wilderness around Poughkeepsie. Um, but he creates basically a fake um, persona of like a making them think it's a separate serial killer. And well, he, no, they blame the previous murders on on that guy, on that guy. But he basically he starts almost exclusively killing prostitutes, mm-hmm. and then uh, plants a uh, police officers. Uh, Semen he got from a fertility clinic. And that's the one jump the shark kind of moment in the movie for me. That's a little cartoonish. Yeah. And, um, and, I mean, the more realistic part is he hides DNA and, like, physical items from the prostitutes in the guy's car, well, which even, is easily possible. Well, also, he, and also, he just tells all the victims around this period that he's a cop. Yeah. And, um,. And is driving around in what we can assume is either a decommissioned police car or a car he's modified to look like a police car. Yeah, because later he, uh, you, there's a tape of him, uh, him near the end of this like Water Street Butcher era. There's a tape of him getting a woman and killing her, and you can see that he has like the cage, the mesh mm-hmm. cage thing. That and she assumes have. he's a police officer when she gets in the car. Yeah. Like, that part is very much, like, it's fairly common for serial killers to impersonate, like, I mean, Ted Bundy impersonated a cop a ton. Yeah. It's par- it's fairly common trick. Um, it also makes me wonder if... Or at least it's well known. Yeah. It also makes me wonder if this guy is either, um, like, he knows law enforcement or is part of it himself. Mm-hmm. Just because... Even, uh, he tells a little girl in the beginning, and A, it's just something you might tell a child, but he does tell her he's a police officer. Well, but he says he's not a cop to the Later woman on, in the yeah. car. Which I assume is him telling the truth, mm-hmm. because, uh... He's gonna kill her. Because he's gonna kill her. He's already in, like, his, um, his sort of mode of, uh, being a serial killer. But essentially by creating this, um, persona... And implicating this police officer, because uh, he hides, he does shit, like, uh, to implicate him. And also the dude already frequents hookers. So that mm-hmm. um, it's fairly, you can see the escalation. Uh, so presumably if, he, like, no, he probably was a guy who frequented prostitutes uh, mm-hmm. and knew uh, knew that... Uh, this guy Th- there's was another this police John. officer who does this con- uh, consistently. Mm-hmm. And so he... Uh, he basically you he uh, somehow I mean it's not that unrealistic he could break into the guy's car and hide yeah. evidence. No, from I just the fertility clinic thing silly to me. It, yeah, it is kind of goofy. Um, yeah, I mean, how do, what do fertility clinics even have? They have like a a vault with cums, and he like broke into their vault. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, know, man. What is that? They have like semen samples. I guess it's probably not that hard to break into it. Just like it's, it would be easy to mm-hmm. like check the security camera footage to figure out who broke into a security, uh, mm-hmm. the the like the semen fridge in a uh, in a fertility clinic. Yeah, our our lead suspects are um, Sobek, the Lord of Semen. Mm-hmm. That's what, who I think might have robbed it. Yeah, well, he could he can just create anybody's semen with their DNA in it. But I thought you were I thought Sobek wanted offerings of semen. What do you think he wants them for? So he can frame you for being a murderer. He can plant your semen anywhere he wants. That's the last time I worship an ancient Egyptian god. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, um, so he, he frames the cop. Uh, it is kind of goofy. Mm-hmm. The cop gets the death penalty. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I think I've seen a lot of people criticize the movie for being a little bit overly cheesy. Like with the documentary aspects. But I like that. And I don't really... I think it doesn't hurt the movie mm. um, at all. I think the only part of the plot that's that unrealistic is the fact that he somehow got the guys come to plant. And, but, uh, but the actual framing part, I think, is like... I think it's genius. If it was just putting like sh- at, like stuff from the prostitutes in the guy's car, mm-hmm. that would be really believable. And I don't know why you'd also need to put his... Uh, his semen at crime scene. Yeah, just with the, all this, like, uh, circumstantial evidence is pretty fucking strong to convict him. Yeah. Especially because of the fact that he clearly kind of profiled this guy. Yeah. And figured out, like... 
Him and it, that guy match the same profile for well, killing yeah. prostitutes. Well, because they pointed out that like he he um, a lot of his time uh, on patrol was in an unmarked car and shit. So that like he this guy is the perfect he had the perfect. Um, if you think about crime, is um, I can't remember what they say. It's like motivation and like op- uh, an opportunity are the two important components of the crime. And even if motivation is iffy, this guy is one of the dudes who, in the world, has the most opportunity to be a prostitute killer. Yeah. And then the, one of the, the... It's almost a funny part, mm. but one of, like, the uh, most interesting parts of the movie is they, they... They've interviewed, like, the son of mm. the guy who was framed, and he's telling the story of how, you know, he became, like, a socially outcast because uh, he was the son of the, the serial killer. Mm-hmm. And then... The Poughkeepsie killer waits until the day after he, uh, the police officer gets the death penalty, mm-hmm. and then he sends another. He sends like a letter Cordets to the priest to, saying uh, you missed a corpse, mm-hmm. and um, they've been killed after he was apprehended. Yep, they've been killed after he was apprehended, and this causes uh, causes him to be exonerated the mm-hmm. day after he was killed on September twelfth, two thousand one. Yeah, and that's the uh, that's the idea is that. Uh, this would have been a big news story, and like his life would have been, uh, would have been like it's basically you have the kid of the guy. It'd be a lot like, more closure. It's ironic life. tragedy that now people still think his dad. They never heard that his dad was exonerated because of nine eleven happened uh, the same day he was uh, Makes executed. You did the Poughkeepsie killer cause 9-11, 9/11 in yep. order to help cover up his crime? It's entirely possible. It's entirely possible. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The I also like talking about the cheesy documentary. Whenever they do those cheesy, this is actually something I like about it because it feels so real. Of as a like a low budget um, true crime documentary, of the part where um, when they go to execute him, they have like a dramatic like reenactment or whatever. And like I've seen so many of those in like you know like low budget docs where it's uh, you know like the faces are slightly blurred out and they're like moving in slow mo. Yeah, the black and white. Yeah, it's so. Something uh, the director. Yeah, I noticed he was like nailed down like a cross yeah. in the uh, in the reenactment. I don't think I'm pretty sure they just put them in a chair. Yeah, something I think the documentary gets really or the movie gets really right is it fits the tone so well of um, like cheesy uh, true like true crime documentaries. Yeah, and it's kind of like a really nice homage to them, and like as like trashy and like schlocky as they are. There's a lot of charm, I think, to the filmmaking. Yeah, I mean, I think I guess people I could understand why it would be off-putting to some people because it's sort of a contrasting tone of how so the actual found footage parts are very well executed horror, mm-hmm. and they're like psychological and linger with you. Mm-hmm. Just like the scenes of torturing the woman that he has captured for eight years and his killings, um, and the most horrifying part is at the end of the movie. Uh, they his house gets found because of the map that he made, like he like map quested it or whatever, and they mm-hmm. used the uh, like the records to uh, to figure out who well, like only one person made a request for that map and printed it out. Mm-hmm. So they find his house, but he had cleaned it all of fingerprints and he left the woman there. Mm-hmm. Um, and it essentially he wanted her to be because uh, he was basically had knew there was too much heat on him. I guess yeah. Um, and so he leaves the town, but the the uh, is it Carol? Carol, I think. Uh, she's left there, and they get an interview with her during the documentary, and it's just horrifying. The actress Cheryl, such, Cheryl, Cheryl, does such a great job. Oh God, of, it's, it's like chilling. Like the the interview with her. If you're not gonna watch this movie because you're off put with the documentary aspects, I would at least suggest watch that interview, mm-hmm. like that part of the movie. It's right near the end. But it's it's a it's really great because it's it's amazing. Like the mm-hmm. the actress that portrays uh, portrays the uh, the victim the victim is is amazing and the the uh, just it, it, you really believe it's like a person who's just been completely mentally broken. Like she keeps asking what they want her to say. Yeah, and being afraid because it's like she's she doesn't she know she's not supposed to have original thoughts anymore. She stopped mm-hmm. doing that because. Uh, because the uh, Poughkeepsie killer would uh, would force her to you know do whatever he wanted her to do. And at one point, there's a, a thing where he, he keeps asking her. It's like a very like um, 
1984, like, how many, uh, what is it, like, how many fingers is he holding up or something? Oh, yeah, how many or lights are there? Oh, uh, how many lights are there? Well, that's also a Star Trek episode. But um, uh, they torture him until, um, torture him until he, like, accepts their version of reality. Mm-hmm. It's where he keeps, like, like saying, like, what's your name? And at first she says Carol, or Cheryl, and then he's like, no, your name is Slave. Yeah. And, like, those kind of techniques he does uh, make it so that her brain doesn't work without, like, a call and response where yeah. they have to tell her what to do. Yeah, and just the, that scene is horrifying, the mm-hmm. way she's just portraying being mentally broken. And it's also, once she escaped, she continued, like, torturing herself because she just can't live without uh, mm-hmm. that pain anymore and ends up killing herself. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but the... Uh, the well, I guess what I was saying is I under the the parts that are found footage in this or the interview with her mm-hmm. are extremely horrifying, and then the parts that are documentary are almost comical. Mm-hmm. So I get why for some people the uh, tonal tonal dissonance between the two parts could be off putting, mm-hmm. but to me I think they work together in a way that uh, that makes it like a uh, pretty a pretty good like I think it makes it almost a fun movie because mm-hmm. the. Uh, the parody of a uh, mm-hmm. of a true crime documentary parts are pretty funny, and then the parts that involve uh, involve the actual found footage. There's scenes he he has this weird outfit where he's dressed like uh, like a plague doctor, like one of the guys from Pathologic. It's mm-hmm. weird. He has like a big robe and a plague doctor mask. It's like he has like one of those like frilly collars that yeah. like, they wore in Victorian England. Which is again it's on that line where mm-hmm. it's starting it's almost becomes ridiculous to the point where it's funny but the found footage scenes themselves are really horrifying. And also it keeps it just in the very we we're talking about like real serial killers are like what you find out is like the our uh our societal idea of a serial killer is like Jason Voorhees or something. Yeah. But really, they're all weird, pathetic. They're mostly worms. huge pussies. They're, yeah, they're all like pathetic worms. And this is exactly the kind of dumb shit that like real serial killers would do of like dress up in their elaborate fan of the opera outfit and be like, you're my slave! Ha mm-hmm. <laughs> ha! So are you saying we should do a theater kid genocide? I'm not not saying that. Because f- I've had this idea cooking around for a while, and I was just waiting for a superficial reason to mm. uh, to trigger it. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is interesting. I-, I just think that's the main criticism I've seen of the movie, uh, is the the tone dissonance mm-hmm. between, uh, between those two parts. But I think it works well. I want to talk about that in a bit. Do you want to talk about the ending of the movie, and then with the alternate endings of the movie, and then go into some general thoughts? Oh yeah, I mean, there's not really a uh, a um, like a thematic story ending. He he leaves. They say he's probably killing somewhere else. They show Cheryl uh, the interview with her, mm-hmm. and then she kills herself. And in the in the Blu-ray edition, mm-hmm. they have a scene of him taking her, like robbing her grave mm-hmm. and taking her body. And he leaves a tape of him doing it at the yeah. thing, but so that's the ending scene. Mm-hmm. And in the other version, they have theatrical a theatrical version. Theatrical version, they have a scene in which he—it's one of just a scene, just a regular scene of one of his crimes where he says, "I'll let you live as long as you don't blink." And then once she blinks, it cuts to credits. Uh, and I was going to say this because of the fact that there was some Mandela effect shit where we watched we watched apparently the um, the Blu-ray edition that was on some streaming service and then it had since been taken off so we pirated, pirated it completely legally mm-hmm. found a uh, alternative streaming service on the internet mm-hmm. legally yeah uh, and uh, and this was the other version the theatrical version and yeah. we kept waiting for the grave robbing scene and then it never happened yeah and it like it was fucking weird we, we spent like 10 minutes looking online to mm-hmm. figure explain this mm-hmm. uh but um but yeah so there's really no uh resolution in yeah. terms of the the story of the killer mm-hmm. um I guess the resolution is Cheryl dying, mm-hmm. you know, because that's the main plot line of the killer. Like, uh, the evolution of his killing is a plot line, but the main thing is his torture of her and her getting broken down as a person. Mm-hmm. Um, and also his, 
I think the, they say in the, in the documentary, someone recent, they say um, the cop who got executed for his crimes is like one of his, is like the most cruel victim he had. Or, I mean, obviously it's Cheryl, but um, that one of the guys basically says that where like he points out that the cop is also basically a, they say they say he used the criminal justice system to take another victim. Yeah, well, I think one guy says it, it was pretty much what he considers to be the crime of the century. Yeah. But it happened the same week as 9-11, so nobody knows about it. But he was saying it's the crime of the century because he used um, he used the criminal justice system to kill a cop. Yeah. Which I'm generally for, but in this case, it seems like he was innocent. Yeah. Innocent of that crime. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, no. So, I mean, that pretty much wraps up the synopsis, the story of the movie. Mm. Yeah. The uh, general theme I was going to talk about is you're talking about like the tonal inconsistencies. Mm-hmm. So something is true is that if this were a real documentary, the um, we wouldn't see as much. They'd like blur out shit, and we wouldn't see as much graphic violence. But like I watched um, a while back, I watched this. Uh, it was like made in like the '90s. It was real cheesy. It was basically a similar thing, and it was a movie or er, movie. It was a uh, doc on um, Ed Gein, right? Mm-hmm. And it had the exact same... I would actually ar- beg the differ of in defense of this movie, is that I think the tone is actually pretty consistent um, because of two reasons. A, film- filmmakers have no shame, and B, uh, law enforcement are fucked up. Well, I don't think that's the criticism. I don't think the criticism is that it's not realistic. I thought you, they, one of the uh, things you read was talking about how it doesn't seem it, like it's disrespectful to the uh, victims and shit like that. Well, well, but that was that was a different thing. That wasn't oh. a criticism of the movie. That was oh. talking to like the theory that the film, oh. the one who made the film, is the one who mm-hmm, is who, the killer. who is the killer. Which I don't think there's a lot of different theories of people trying to theorize like people in the movie being the killer. Mm. And I, I don't think any of those hold any water. Mm. But the, the criticism isn't uh, about that. The criticism is essentially it's as a movie. It's not about oh. whether it's realistic to a documentary. Mm-hmm. The criticism is that in a horror movie that can be as dark and horrifying as this it also includes things that are almost comical and sometimes le- legitimately comical in light and tone mm-hmm. which I and I don't really support that criticism I think that the movie has a good balance of mm-hmm. things that are lighter in tone uh, and things that are darker mm-hmm. I think it works I mean I can't exactly explain why it works because it doesn't sound like it should work I also but it does I also don't mind that in my horror movies of like the original Evil Dead has like a lot of moments of kind of can't like uh, of like kind of comedy of like the absurdism of original it. Original Evil Dead? I don't think it does. No, no, it's towards the end of just like how uh, how exasperated Ash is once like once he finally like at first he's horrified and shell shocked, but then once he gets like the chainsaw and shit, he just gets completely uh, like fuck it. I mean, the only comedic scene I can remember in that movie is when the, the woman got raped by a tree. You know, if I was I was that was a side splitter. I was I couldn't stop laughing for weeks uh, from that one. I don't uh, think I don't remember Evil. De- I remember Evil Dead being like a really atmospheric one where it's, it's almost uh, not watchable because well, of how. Uh, how beating you over the head with the dark atmosphere. At, at the is. end, when he's like, he's like, re- he's like swinging an axe and like throwing them into the fire. There's like some kind of comedic uh, shit. I don't really remember that. Army of Darkness is a masterpiece. Well, though. Army of Darkness is just a, a complete comedy. comedy. It has no yeah. horror elements. But um, getting back to the Poughkeepsie sea tapes, is that like, I don't know what I just what, what I also like is a lot of the comedy comes from the Talking Heads. And yeah. this is where I get to my point of law enforcement are, are fucked up, of like very much a coping mechanism is for humor. And for a lot of those, I was saying with a lot of those real serial killer uh, documentaries, um, you'll have like the it'll be like guy who discovered um, the bone altar, and he'll be like, well, you know, I guess he was just a just kind of an amateur interior designer, <laughs> and that kind of like cop humor is actually pretty, uh, like, realistic. And I I don't know, I kind of like that. Well, but I don't think saying it's realistic is a defense of a no, movie. No, no, no. Because like, the most most realistic movie would just be two people sitting silently for an I, I'm not. I'm not talking about, like, I'm not saying that that's a uh, thing of itself. I'm saying it's a kind of humor that really exists, and I like it in this, because I think it, um, the, the pseudo-documentary format, like, it very much, um, like, I guess what I'm saying is it's, They've clearly watched a bunch of old cheesy documentaries and kind of mimicked some of that. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I just, I don't know. To me, it, it just works. I don't under, I don't know if I can uh, exactly articulate, mm-hmm. but I, I just think the tone shifting from darker things to lighter things works. I guess it's more the you get interested in the mystery of. Uh, I think it's almost not a horror movie. Like mm-hmm. it's almost, it's not. It's like basically a documentary. Yeah, and you know, it's it's an interesting. I mean, I think it it has. I think it might be why people criticize it is it gets pictures a horror movie. But to me, it has more of the same effect as if I were watching a real documentary. Yeah, it is a documentary uh, set in a fictional world. Yeah, like I, I think you you should go in expecting more of like watching the mystery and the story unfold the way you would like. Li- oh, here's a documentary about a serial killer I've never heard of, right? Mm-hmm. And you you are interested in oh, here's the mystery of how it happened. Here's a here's a description. You want to hear the story more mm-hmm. than uh, wanting a pure horror experience. And then at the end, it'll be like. Will he kill again? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's more of a it's more of a a I guess maybe that's why the tone works is it's more of like a a parody doc serial killer documentary that's genuinely interesting with certain scenes and aspects to it that are genuinely horrifying, mm-hmm. which I think is I think you you should more view the horrifying the horror nature of this as a an added on part, but the real genre is like a mockumentary of a serial killer. Which is funny because when you say mockumentary, it implies comedy. Well, that's um, what I, right at the start of the movie, I was struggling because the the framing device I kept waiting for it to because the office and, sh- and like Parks and Rec is the main use of mockumentary. So it's just, I'm so used to that t- style of production uh, being used for comedy that for like the first five minutes I was out of it because I was waiting for uh, the office gym to stare at the camera. And it's also good because the talking heads they cycle through, while they provide moments of levity, also a lot of the true the horror comes from them because there's a part of it that's like uh, where the one guy whose job was, he was like some poor intern whose job was oh, yeah. the videotapes, and he was saying like he um, he was watched, took some of them home to watch, and his wife accidentally watched an hour of it, and she was like fucking traumatized. Yeah. Didn't have sex with him for a year, I think. Yeah. Um... And they're just talking about, like, that guy throughout the uh, movie, he'll make, like, little jokes here and there. But, like, when you look at his face when he describes um, that occurrence, it's, like, real fucked up. Yeah. And, like, part of the... Almost in releasing those videotapes, he almost made the entire, like, FBI people uh, who were looking for him, he made them, like, his next group of victims because of the fact that, like, there's this psychological... I'm I'm talking metaphorically here, but I'm saying I'd rather have to watch some tapes of people getting killed and get killed. No, no, I I know. I'm just talking about that. Like he probably gets joy out of the fact that he's inflicting like psychological damage on them too. Mm. Like you get what I'm saying? Like he clearly made the videotapes because it gratifies him for people to see his uh, murders, and probably there's some Schadenfreude of like the displeasure of having to watch those. It is interesting. I'm surprised there hasn't been some sort of social media serial killer yet who you. I guess it's more um, spree killings are the new yeah. serial killing. Well, I was saying it was a. It was almost of like you know there was that Christchurch guy who like uh, live streamed it, right? Yeah, and I was saying that we're like part of the reason he wanted to do that was to horrify people who saw the uh, like the people shooting. who say the n word a lot mm-hmm. as to to like as a joke, and they're just there. They want the reaction of provoking people into anger. Because I enjoy that, and I legitimately think that's part of, like, within the psychology of this killer, that seems to be why he made the tapes. Yeah. Because he wanted to fuck with people. Mm-hmm. My, my point being was that, I know it was kind of a dramatic thing to say that they're, like, his victims, but, like, that guy and, like, a lot of the people who work on the case that talk have clearly had, like, their personal lives, like, really affected and, like, their mental health. And yeah, it like, adds the atmosphere of horror when you have so many people who are like mentally affected in a negative way it's it's like the idea that like uh, the monster you don't see is always scarier mm-hmm. only seeing like throughout the movie maybe 30 minutes of it is playing the tapes mm-hmm. and then having people clearly having been mentally destroyed by watching these mm-hmm. it, in your mind creates a scarier set of tapes of the ones you didn't see mm-hmm. than you, they could ever actually make even if they really tortured people for the movie right yeah it's just, it really, um, yeah, the implication of the killer is, like, such a good, um, because, like, him actually on camera isn't, like, or him, like, talking on camera isn't that much of a portion of the movie. Yeah. 
like insights into because we we see what he does in the tapes but we don't know why he does it and then the entire uh, i mean we get a pretty fucking good idea mm -hmm. but a lot of the um talking head analysis is trying to figure out his motivations and like psychologically profile him yeah um one of my favorite scenes is do you remember when they're uh, reading all the psychological profiles. Of oh, the yeah, yeah. There's one point in the movie where they're talking about how he was able to change up his MO between killings. Mm -hmm. uh, and why that made him hard to catch is they read. They had, like, 20 different profiles done, and they all disagree on, like, every aspect. Yeah, they're like, some he's, like, educate. he's highly educated, some he's mentally handicapped, some he's, like, working class, some he works in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. One even thought he might be an FBI profiler. Yeah. And there's, like, a look of... He says that last... And, like, the, the FBI profiler who says that, like, he looks kind of, like, haunted. Yeah. Because clearly, I, I would have to assume that implies that he had to investigate uh, his colleagues and have them investigate him at some point. I think he look, just looks more exasperated by how yeah. different all of the ones were. Mm-hmm. You know? That's probably... I mean, that's probably mostly true. Yeah. But, yeah, do, do you want to move on? Do you have any, like, general statements about it? Because I feel like we've summarized the plot and gotten the mm -hmm. gist of the movie pretty well. Uh, yeah, I guess one of the things I'll say is it's for... If you are um, if you have, like, a ratio of, like, budget to how good the movie is, it may have the highest score of, like, that category of... Um, like, Certainly. What was it? $400,000 budget? Mm-hmm. Which I, I'm actually surprised by because I feel... I guess they got... Some legitimate actors or something. Act, you have to pay actors. You have to get shooting locations, and probably most of it, honestly, because of that style, was in post production. Um, I guess I just think um, like it seems like most of the sets they used were houses. Mm -hmm. So it's just like you get five friends who will loan you their house. Uh -huh. If I assume one person working on that goes to college, so you get them to try and rent out like a lecture room that's empty. I feel like you could make that movie for a lot less. Yeah, I just. I mean, it was clearly well worth the money they put into it. Yeah. But I was just thinking of, like, the um, the amount of money. It's, like, famously, uh, Reservoir Dogs cost, like, $2 million to make. Uh-huh. That's of, uh, that movie cost, uh, you know, a fifth of that. And it's of a similar qual. Uh, I would rate it of a similar quality of movie, if not a little better. Mm. You know what I mean? Oh, it's definitely better than Reservoir Dogs. I mean, I'm just dog shit. I, I'm saying, that for, to me, they're both like A minus movies. Uh, I don't know. Reservoir Dogs is pretty bad. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know if I'd give this movie as high as as high of an A minus. It, it's mm -hmm. more. I would argue it's more of like an interesting experiment than it is valuable as a movie standing by itself. You know, like I think if there was a larger genre of like mockumentary horror, this probably wouldn't. Uh, wouldn't uh, stand up. It would. It wouldn't take too long for it to be surpassed by mm. a, a better made movie. But the uniqueness provides a. But the uniqueness of the the experiment of its design mm. um, get, lends it a lot of in, lends it a lot a lot of interest. Which does I I think that's I just want to circle back because I feel like I didn't quite finish. But it does it does create that criticism of the tonal dissonance. But like I said, I think you view if you view it more as purely a mockumentary that has horror elements, then it's it makes sense from that last. Yeah, it's not necessarily trying to scare you. Well there certainly the tapes are trying to scare it's you. It's trying to fuck with you. I like I, to me there's a difference. No, I think like the scenes with um like the hitchhiker scene. Yeah, I guess so. Or the scene where he like is hiding in uh, Cheryl's house before that's, he kidnaps that's her. That's way more conventional, yeah, horror. But I was gonna say a lot of to me the ones that that like messed me up the most were ones that were it was just like trying to fuck with me. Yeah, it has more subtle psychological elements. The same way listening to an actual serial killer documentary might fuck you up more than watching like a. a, a Halloween. ISIS beheading video. Yeah, yeah. Well, or, yeah. Watching. Well, I, I mean, I, that kind of is the other way. Where like a, a horror movie that has like the most terrifying monster mm. could fuck you up. But you get more. You can often get more psychologically fucked up from watching like a real documentary where they get into uh, into what the uh, the real killers did. And so lending that sort of uh, that sort of framing device allows for a deeper psychological horror mm -hmm. uh, in the the work, even though it lessens some of the like visceral horror of it. Makes it sure it makes it less scary. When he's gonna kill somebody, it when it's like a weird grainy camera, and in between you have people that are like, oh, like chuckle fucks talking about uh, the psychology of it. 
but it adds to a larger psychological horror because of the mockumentary elements. Like we're pretty seasoned horror movie watchers, and afterwards we were like turning the lights on to make sure that no way was going to jump out. Well, the first time I watched this, it was pretty bad. I think this time it wasn't. The psychological yeah. element wasn't too bad. No, I just mean the fact that we were still we still were flipping the lights on to make oh, sure yeah. nobody could jump out at us. Yeah, yeah. Because act whatever this movie does, the psychological effect is it leaves a lingering. Um, like animal like alert uh, yeah. thing to where like when like a, a dog hears a noise and it has to like walk around and patrol the house for, yeah. like three times before it can go back to bed. I mean I really think it all comes back to the documentary style of it mm-hmm. because if I think about it like I could get scared shitless by uh, you know a movie like Halloween where it's like a a, a clear like almost supernatural force mm-hmm. hunting someone yeah. but I'm gonna sleep fine at night mm-hmm. that night even that night because it's not that really that scary on a deeper level because Michael some, Myers isn't that real yeah but something like a serial killer documentary will make, couldn't make you feel genuinely unsafe it's not as scary in the moment but it lingers with you and makes you feel unsettled for especially a long the idea of, of like a guy who stalks you and hides in your closet uh, yeah. And waits for you to fall asleep. Well, but most serial, as like most serial killers, he kills mostly women, so I'm fine. Yeah. He gets some men in there, though. Yeah. He's an equal opportunity Finally, player. men get a win, you know? Mm-hmm. We, we haven't had a win in so long, we really needed this well, one. Well, it's always, though. like, homosexual, like, boy killers. That's always, like, the guys who kill men as uh, serial killers. Mm-hmm. I can't think of a straight man who killed other men. Yeah, I mean, it's always... A sexual... Whenever a straight man kills another man, it's because it's the boyfriend of Uh whatever woman they uh, can't get pussy from. It's not really a chain of serial murders. Yeah. Well, honestly, yeah, what? The only serial killers who killed mostly men were Gacy, Adamer... Gay. Um, Are those the only two? Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's... uh, What did Robert Kraft? Gay. Gay, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty... I guess it's always... I guess the 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 point is is that it's almost it's almost always men. It's or all, it, it literally is always men who are serial killers, mm-hmm. and they always kill people that they want to fuck. Yeah. So, uh, so it that either means it's a straight man killing women or a gay man killing oh, men. The only exception is a Zodiac or a Son of Sam where they're shooting couples. Oh yeah, but again, I feel like that's yeah. kind of an extension of wanting to fuck the girlfriend. Mm-hmm. They like are jealous of the. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Of the the boyfriend, I mean that's like he, the in this movie the Kipsky killer kills, like his most brutal dismemberment is of Cheryl's boyfriend. Because mm-hmm. there's a well, there is a category of serial killer where it's just like I, I can only describe it as like the debauchery where if they're not if they're indiscriminate about who they kill, um, it's because of however they do it is the release, not uh, not the victim of like Richard Ramirez would just go in and kill anybody. Yeah. Yeah, but I think that's what I think that's probably why is it seems like most serial killers kill a, a demographic that they're mm-hmm. like get sexually attracted to because there's so much of a that aspect of it being like a sexual fixation that so many serial killers have. I just really do think the thinking about it the uh, the cop execution thing that's like the greatest hook shot. Oh uh, yeah, it, like that's like. Put it's a that, really clever idea. You put that man in, like the Hall of Fame. You hang his jersey from the rafters. Like that—that's great writing there. It's a great. I mean, I, again, the semen thing mm. is kind of jumps the shark. Well, because it's also like that kind of shit has kind of happened before. Of it hasn't been like a, framed like a cop for it, but like um, you heard the the Boston Strangler case or no. whatever, where basically um, Albert DeSalvo was a guy who maybe committed one of the Boston Strangler murders. But he got pinned for basically, like, all of it, even though it was pretty much almost clearly three different guys. Oh, okay. So there have been cases like that before where it's, like, misidentified. But it probably wasn't intentional. Yeah. By the other two. Mm-hmm. To but my point him. is is that it's, like, a, an extension of, um, well, they probably started killing because they knew they could get away with it because there was, it would fall under the umbrella of the Boston Strangler murders. Okay. Because it was just that if you started... Because it was like the victim changes, where it was like all white women, and then it was all black women, and then it was all like old ladies of all races. Mm-hmm. So there's like three different killers. Mm-hmm. But I just found that that hook shot is like... That's impressive. Yeah. It's like a um, an intellectual serial killer... And that he didn't have to use a knife to kill the guy. He had the criminal justice system itself kill the guy. Yeah. In a way that's almost like... 
if you think about like serial killers wanting power, he like made the criminal justice system his bitch. Mm-hmm. That's messed up. I mean, it's kind of cool, also. I mean, it's kind of cool because we just respect anyone who's really good at their job. Yeah, like Michael Jordan, who's a clear. So they got to come out with a video game that's like a sandbox where you can be any type of serial killer you want. Mm-hmm. Or else I might start killing people if they don't come out with that type of video game. So it's just, Minecraft. It seems really fun, you know? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. You I mean, why to... would so many people do it if it wasn't fun? You just need to keep putting those legal disclaimers in there. Oh, yeah, allegedly it seems really fun in, mm-hmm. in Roblox. Mm-hmm. Unless we can get a plane ticket to Thailand in which uh, we, yeah. we're good. In which case it's not alleged. If <laughs> I recently took a trip to Thailand, it's all, all that shit I said is true. What if, unless we're going for a Muay Thai fight? Oh, that's true. Uh, well, why not both? You know, kill a couple women, mm-hmm. have a Muay Thai fight, mm-hmm. get back to America in time for dinner. So you're saying that if you um, go to uh, Thailand, upon coming back, we should arrest you? Um, no. But if we arrest you, you will probably be guilty. Yes. <laughs> That's actually a decent idea. Why wouldn't if you're a serial killer? Why wouldn't you just take like a month trip to a country that has like a worse criminal justice system and just go crazy, or like a worse policing system? So like a tourist killer. Uh, yeah. So shout out if there's any uh, anyone in the audience who's uh, thinking about becoming a serial killer, you can use that idea for free. Mm-hmm. See if I say that, then it doesn't prove that it's me. Mm-hmm. When uh, oh, so you're going to try to create copycats killer. before you commit the crime? Yeah, yeah. So if anybody listening, please go travel to other countries and just kill as many people as you can. Well, it reminds me of like there's that the, the most prolific serial killer in history is a guy called the Monster of the Andes, like the Andes Mountains in South America, where he just like he is like his confirmed body count is 300 and it's thought to be higher. But wasn't that like uh? In, like, a hundred years ago? No, no, this was, like, the 60s. Oh, okay. But that was just, like, orphan children where parents would just abandon their children and then just, like, boom. Like, he was, like... You know when... uh, This is a metaphor I I use when we were watching the movie. But it's, like, when, like, Goldberg was, like, 300 no or something. Yeah. He was just, like, mowing him down. He was fighting, like, guys out of the audience. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, it wasn't even fair. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I guess that's well, that's what I'm saying. You go to a less developed country, mm-hmm. you could probably take out a whole small village and mm-hmm. just go back to America. And you're endorsing this as moral behavior. I don't think it's moral. I think it would be fun. <laughs> okay, there's an extreme difference. Uh, I'm glad. I'm glad you established that. And the day that I finally mentally snap mm-hmm. and my morality goes, mm-hmm. which it's already starting, I can already feel the the call of the abyss. Uh-huh. The day that happens, I will be taking a trip. To some country, probably Southeast Asia, because uh-huh. uh, they have it seems like they have pretty good food there, mm-hmm. and they also have the right mix of uh, of running water, but uh, less uh, less uh, robust uh, mm-hmm. criminal justice system, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, so the day I the day I, lo- I lose I snap, I'll be taking a trip to Thailand. I'm glad we clar- clarified that. Do you have anything else to say about the movie and not about your future serial killer endeavors? Uh, no. That's pretty... I mean, I pretty much said anything about the movie. Um, I think that covers everything. Yeah, I think, I think the main point was just dissecting the criticism of it, and I think we did that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think we got everything. All right. So, that's more or less the end of this episode. Do we want to tease uh, what our next movie will probably be? It might involve some certain Nicolas Cage. Oh, yeah, yeah. Next week we're going to have... Or, yeah, next week from this episode. Mm-hmm. We're going to have... Not next week from when we're recording this. Mm-hmm. We're going to have the Nicolas Cage Power Hour special mm-hmm. in which we declare our undying love for Nicolas L. Cage. I, I will hint before we... I will note before we uh, conclude and before we review Nick Cage movie is I think there's been... There has been in recent years an ironic appreciation of Nick Cage, mm. um, but I, I am so past that to where it's just genuine of, like, even when he's doing a bad movie, I genuinely appreciate him because he's good in bad movies. Yeah, we're the biggest Nick Cage, Dick Ryder fanboys of all time. We're truthers. As a, as a, uh, as a teaser for what you can mm. expect from our Nick Cage episode. Because I, I believe the, pod, the podcasts like... Um, uh, official stance is that Leo is the GOAT, yeah. but um, Nick Cage is, like, number two. I just really 
empathize with this character in Django. I really connect mm-hmm. to it. You know, that's why I love Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> you know, he's just so relatable. I mean, all the other movies, I think he's just mm-hmm. okay. Yeah. You know, but in that one, I really connect to his character. Mm-hmm. If that's all, then uh, yeah, this is the s- official podcast of Martin Coolhaven signing off. Uh, follow us on Twitter. Yeah. Uh, at Chillery Clinton, except it's there's like, like a number afterwards. Yeah, it's like shit. it's like the L. You know how about you don't follow me on Twitter, pussy? Yeah. Got him at Heel Dumoulin. It's, it's It'll be linked in the description. I call I yeah. Tell them not to follow me, and then they want to do it to spite uh, me. Or uh, if you like wrestling, go to my YouTube channel. Wrestling. All right, that's enough. That's enough self promotion. This is a pristine uh, system, and you can't be sullying it with uh, your motivations of purely monetary success. It's disgusting what you're doing to this great artistic podcast. It's now sullied. Go fuck yourself.